Yeah, first off, uh, appreciate everybody being here today. Uh, a great time to get back together and, and uh, don't know when the last time I was able to have a, a press conference with, with the guys who and, and people who cover our uh, team and so wanted to make sure that we have opportunity to, to communicate and, and, and be clear there. It was great to see uh, uh, Bennett Durando over the past uh, couple of days and get to get, get caught up with him. Blair, appreciate you being back. I'm glad that, that everything's going positive for you. Um, want to start with just announcing and talking about some newcomers um, to our team. Um, God, it was weird not looking back there and seeing Andrew, you know. Oh, I know. I'm sorry. No, you're a great replacement. I just I'm used to used to Andrew back there. So. Um, Added DJ Coleman transfer from Jacksonville State uh, at the defensive end position. Uh, very excited about him coming on board. Uh, added LJ Hewitt, uh, who's from Palmetto, Florida, uh, played uh, uh, at Holmes Junior College and then transferred to Mississippi Gulf Coast. He was a qualifier out of high school um, and felt like that we needed to, to add some um, position at the defensive back. Uh, position, so we were uh, very excited about that. Um, Demarion Houston, Peanut, um, a transfer wide receiver from um, Hutchinson Community College, uh, started his career in Nebraska, went to Hutchinson Community College, uh, and is back. Uh, wide receiver, uh, has great speed, explosiveness, ball in his hand. We're really excited about what he can do, obviously, with the loss of, uh, of a player at that position. Felt like it was important for us to get that uh, immediately. Josh Landry, a defensive tackle. Um, we're excited that we were able to get him a transfer from Baylor. And uh, with the uh, injury news that I'll share in a little bit, that became a very important uh, position for us to add. Um, there is one other, um, but he will be enrolled uh, a school on Friday, and so I'm not going to be able to discuss him right now, but uh, we'll be able to discuss him once he gets here uh, and gets going. Actually, he'll be here tomorrow, but won't enroll in school till Monday. But really appreciative to our, our coaches and, and, and more importantly our recruiting staff and our player personnel staff, Ryan Trichel and those guys who did a tremendous job of identifying these players who we feel like can help us immediately. We played a little bit of, uh, of hide and seek with, with Demarion, you know, because he was really could potentially have been a 23, but uh, with the work of our recruiting staff and our academic department being able to get him graduated uh, and enrolled in class this year made him eligible immediately. So that was a big plus um, for us. Um, so again, really excited about those guys. We have had uh, an injury. Uh, Daniel Robledo has an upper body extremity injury um, and will be out probably until the bye week. Uh, at the defensive tackle position. And so that created a, a real need right there for Josh Landry. As far as uh, other players who have joined the program, um, our signees on campus, um, Val Erickson, Carmichael Glass, Marquise Graciel, Sam Horn, T-Man, Tavars Jones here, graduates um, uh, next week, but here. Jalen Marshall, Curtis Piegler, Isaac Thompson, Jamarian Wayne, DJ Westlock, and Tristan Wilson all are on campus and ready to go and, and uh, just had a meeting with those guys at 10 o'clock. And so uh, very excited about them. We also added Jack Abraham, um, who's going to provide um, uh, competition and depth at the quarterback position. Brett Brown, uh, Boyton Chaney, Anthony Favreau, uh, Xavier Machado, Jack McGrary, Nate Norris, and Nick Quadrini. Um, yep, there it is. Sorry. And then I talked about arriving this weekend, Makai Lee, um, offensive tackle transfer, who is a three for three uh, from Coffeyville Community College. We're very excited about getting him uh, um, going with our team this weekend. Did I miss anything on new additions? Good. Have had a couple of roster updates, obviously. Um, several players have transferred out from the program. Um, 
Zaquan Reeves, Ben Key, John Jones, J.J. Hester, and Stacy Brown. And we wish them be- the best of luck on their journey. And um, we are excited. Ennis Rakestraw, Martez Manuel, Chris Abramstrain, and Kai Montgomery are all full speed, ready to go with no restrictions uh, for the rest of the summer. So uh, very excited about that. I guess the last conversation that I'll have before I turn over to questions, just got back from the spring SEC meetings. There was a lot of conversations and topics discussed. Um, one was scheduling model. Um, uh, one was um, future scheduling in, in regards to adding Oklahoma and Texas to the league. Um, NIL and its effect and disruption of college football and transfer rules specifically within the SEC. Um, I think there's going to be further conversations um, with the presidents and with the athletic directors as far as the overall stance uh, with the SEC and what we're going to do moving forward. But it was really good for our for our coaches, head coaches, to get in there and have conversations and, 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 and um, share what our opinions would be um, moving forward. And so we did that. And, uh, it was good to, 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 to be able to do that, and, and now we're continuing to move on and refocus on our team uh, for this summer. So with that, I'll turn it over to questions. You uh, know now roster building kind of never takes any time off. I mean, do yeah. you anticipate, are there places you're still looking to add to this roster, any specific positions between now and fall camp? Um. You know, we've kind of taken the approach that best available player or somebody we felt like could really impact our roster in a positive way, um, that w- we could potentially make room for them. Um, but um, we're not actively seeking anybody right now. And, and, and would have to be a position of need and have multiple years of eligibility. I think we're, we're almost done portal shopping, almost. But I, I think in this day and age, you never say never. Yeah, I agree with that. Can you, do you stand on one side of that argument? Do you, do you approach it as what's best for Mizzou or what's best for Mizzou? I think both. I, I think I'm a representative for Mizzou, and I think uh, I, I think you can look at it from a, a lot of different perspectives. Um, I have my opinions on which one I believe is best. Um, I, you know, I do believe that one of the things that makes the Southeastern Conference so unique and special is the tradition and pageantry of the games and the longstanding rivalries that we have um, outside of even particularly Mizzou. And I, I understand maybe a little bit more now being at Mizzou and not having playing a consistent rivalry with a long term team, whether that was be Kansas or Illinois and the disruption that causes to the fan base and now trying to recreate or not recreate re start a rivalry with Arkansas um, and how that's a little bit more difficult and challenging. And so I do think um, for our league, when we are, if we do away with divisions and go into a rotating conference schedule, that the consistency of rivalries are going to be important um, to the passion of the Southeastern Conference. So uh, that would be my stance on I think it's important to do that. You can read between the lines on which one that means I would support. But um, I, I do think that um, we have to be careful of getting away from playing consistent games in our conference that mean so much to our fan bases. Coach, you had several quarterbacks come in uh, throughout the offseason. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, and I, I've been very consistent on saying this, I thought Brady Cook and Tyler Macon both had good springs, uh, and us looking at a potential transfer quarterback was really no slight on them. It was more a, uh, there's one thing that neither one of those guys can change, and it's the amount of experience they have um, playing college football. And so, you know, in our first six games, we have three on the road at Kansas State, at Auburn, at Florida, and the only uh, – uh, the best teacher is experience. And so in those situations, um, having an experienced quarterback uh, was something that, you know, 
was important um, and something that we were looking for. Um, you know, so Jack provides us that experience and accountability uh, and understanding of what those environments are. Um, but by no means is that, you know, I saw a headline that uh, he was the presumed starter. I think that was a presumed uh, headline. That, that That is not the case at all. Uh, it's an open competition. I think <clears throat> with the, um, you know, we're very excited about Sam, and I think I've been very clear since uh, the start of spring that I would not name a starter until Sam Horn had the opportunity to compete for that position. And that is ongoing and starting right now as he's been on campus and we've been able to utilize OTAs, uh, individual skill instruction we are calling OTAs, uh, and, and allow him to get up to speed. And so we're doing that right now. Um, but I, I'm not naive to the fact that Sam is a, a has going to have a difficult choice in front of him in mid-July as he is an unbelievable baseball player with the ability to get drafted and is going to have to make a decision on which sport he wants to pursue in the future. Um, I've met with his family and, and him, and we believe that uh, he's got a great, unbelievable future here as both a football player and, and a baseball player uh, within the Mizzou football and, and baseball families, and that's what we're uh, pushing him on. But I also am not naive to the fact that he could choose to proceed, uh, per, pursue a a career in the major leagues, and I could not stay status quo and only have two uh, quarterbacks on the roster with experience, and so needed to have somebody else. And so to go back to your question about Jack Abraham full circle, that was something that um, we had to have. And so being able to explain that to both Brady, um, Tyler, our football team, and the Horns, um, the team, the team, the team comes first, and I have to put ourselves in a position for our team to be successful uh, with contingency plans. And so that's what we were able to do. And, and Jack, again, has experience, has been in multiple systems, and will have the ability to compete for the starting job. Um, but those four guys will be the guys, and, and we'll see which one comes out uh, as, as the starter sooner rather than later. I know that draft is like early to mid-July. What, but what's the time frame for you actually knowing what Sam is going You know, is there a deadline after that draft or, or – deadline for Sam to make a decision with you guys? Mm -mm. No, there's no deadline. You're okay. so, I think... Uh, uh, I mean, as far as... I'm not saying you've set one, but like when class starts or, you know, is there a, a deadline as far as the Major League Baseball, he has to decide what he's doing? Yeah, you know what? I haven't even asked that question. Um, that's a good question, Gabe. I, I've only... You know, I know when the draft is, and I think once the draft happens and his people meet with their people and kind of figure out what the deal is presented to them, then they can make an educate, they can make the best decision for them. And, and yeah, I, my assumption is on July 31st, when we report to camp that our, all of our players that are going to be there are going to be there. So July 31st, I guess, is probably the deadline. Obviously, Jack brings that experience. Yeah. Yeah, um, you know, I've been in, in, in Destin for the past uh, two days, just got back yesterday, have been able to watch the tape on the OTAs. We'll know more tomorrow after we go again in the morning for an OTA and see kind of where Sam is throwing the football. But obviously, I mean, you're talking about a guy who led his team to an uh, undefeated uh, season in Georgia. Uh, state championship, guy that's got multi-years experience, obviously he's got uh, an elite level arm talent. He's big, strong, physical player. He's got a lot of uh, ability, but he's got a lot of development to do, and he's got to get sped up to the game of college football. So, um, but you know, he's everything that we we knew we were getting when we recruited him. Yeah. You know, that's a great question. I think the advisement that I was uh, received from the SEC and um, have asked is just for an interpretation from our general counsel on what is um, what they believe that law allows us to do. Um, you know, I think there were some, some very smart guardrails. I know that I cannot be uh, a third party, meaning I can't connect players to 
uh, uh, NIL deals. I think I can be involved in in um, conversations regarding, you know, um, encouraging our fans potentially to do NIL opportunities and in, in, in business leaders. And I think that really was the, the key piece is that there's a little bit more freedom there for me to have discussions um, with leaders. But we're still trying to figure out exactly what that law allows us to do. Yeah, that's actually uh, was a, a big part of the law was that to ensure that there was um, financial literacy training. We do NIL opportunity training. Um, we, we've partnered through Open Doors, which is uh, uh, our our software company that tracks our uh, contracts and, and makes sure that those contracts are reviewed by our compliance so that they're legal. Um, we do do a financial literacy. We had a CPA come in and talk about how to file it. Um, uh, a tax return and, and what was important as far as being a 1099 con contracted employee and what they needed to do. And so we're definitely um, trying to do the very best we can um, to get these young men um, up to speed on on the money that they're getting and how they have to be responsible for that money. Eli, you got a chance to talk to some of your peers and, and talk about college football right now. What's, what's the feeling amongst a lot of the SEC coaches? Does there need to be some stability coming in? It's seemed somewhat chaotic the last couple of years. Yeah, you know, honestly, I think a lot of coaches are timid to, to, to make a whole lot of comments just because it seems like uh, whatever comments you made are going to be construed in, in, in maybe some sort of fashion as you're against NIL or you're for NIL or whatever. I think that we're all consistent in that we would prefer if, if um, there was a limit on um, third party involvement and players making decisions based off boosters' promises of, of, of compensation. I think um, the original intent of NIL is what we all agree with, that players should have the ability to utilize their name, image, and likeness for financial gain um, but it you know with no guardrails on it I think it, it it's ascended probably more quickly than any of us uh, anticipated and so now trying to put our arms around it is a little bit challenging um, I think we're all understanding that we love the game of football and we love college athletics and we love the mission of, of college athletics which is utilize um, sports to help provide young men with an opportunity to get an education so that not only can they um, pursue a game that is a worthy game and something that they're worthwhile doing that could potentially lead to the NFL, but they're also giving, guaranteeing themselves to change their lives through a great degree at one of our prestigious universities. Um, and so I think we all understand that that's still a, a great thing, and we want them to be able to do both. When we talk about all the time with our programs, Chase Two Dreams, a life with football and a life outside of the game. Um, and we're still committed to that. I think we're all committed to that. Um, and there's been a lot of disruption to the game of football, whether it's been COVID, opt-outs, transfer portal, NIL, uh, you name it, we're dealing with it, playoffs, expansion, scheduling models, adding teams. There's been a lot going on. I think what we we all understand is that we love competing on Saturdays and we love the pageantry of the games, and and we're still committed to trying to, to ensure that the, that stays in place moving forward. I think we all uh, have a lot of faith in Greg Sankey and, and know that he has a clear vision for the SEC and what he's going to do, and we support him in that vision. And, and uh, you know, we just want to make sure that we're we're doing what's in the best interest of these young men moving forward and their families moving forward. When you're talking about third party involvement, booster promises and stuff, other than the fact that this is public now and we know a lot of these things are happening, is there a significant difference now that NIL is legal in recruiting versus what a lot of people have, they thought it was for 20 or 30 years? I believe there is. I believe there is. I never heard any stories of players making multi-million dollar deals. I never heard of players going in the transfer portal and figuring out what their NIL worth was before. So 
I think one of the things that we're all trying to figure out is what is public versus what is not public. What has, you know, what is um, real and um, what is not real as far as when it comes to uh, NIL. So I think we're all still trying to, to figure that out. Um, and, and the word transparency was used a lot, like transparency in, in what, what is going on. Um, versus what what isn't being transparent. And again, I think what we don't want to have happen is we, we want young men to make a decision based off what's in the best interest of their family and their futures for, for you know, where they, they believe they need to go get the best education possible and the best opportunity possible to play football uh, without the inducement of NIL, without the inducement of NIL. And that that's all we're, we're – Looking at, I think. You, you know, where things stand out, unless there will be guardrails, do you feel like Mizzou is in a good position, behind at disadvantage, or, or what? As far as talking about third party, talking about the future of involvement, things like that. I don't know, because I don't know the transparency aspect. I, it's right. like you're chasing a ghost, kind of like you don't really know what everybody else is doing, and believe us, none of us were in there telling us telling each other like oh I got the I mean nobody knew so I mean it's I don't know I, I feel really good about the fact that we are the fourth largest GDP in the SEC I feel really good about the fact that we have passionate fans I feel really good about the business leaders of our community trying to um, figure out what's the best ways to help our program be successful um, and I feel like there's a lot of NIL opportunities in not only uh, St. Louis Kansas City, which are two top 50 media markets in the country, um, also with Springfield. So, I, I mean, I feel good about the opportunities when it all comes together. I think that's still something that, that um, as Mizzou, we got to continue to all come together to work for the University of Missouri and, 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 and continue to push that direction. You talked about it a little bit with the quarterbacks, but in this hey, era of free transfers now, how cognizant you have to be of that with, I mean, like, is redshirting a thing that still exists? I mean, has, do you have to manage your current players any differently now going into a season, knowing that the threat they can can pick up and leave is, is always there? I think we're all figuring out the new norms of college football in a hurry. Uh, and the reality of it is it's all new norms. And so, you know, Gabe, you ask a, a tremendous question. I think I feel the most settled about my football roster for the 2022 season than I have all year today because I know that the guys that are in this locker room are committed to be in this locker room, and I don't have to fear of them transferring out as of right now. Um, they want to be here for 2022 football season. Now, I mean, there's all kinds of other – unpredictable things that could occur for, for reasons why people wouldn't be here. But as of now, it's not a conscious choice for players no, to not be here. My mindset, my mindset with our team, my mindset with my coaching staff, with those guys is let's focus on building this football team for this year to the very best that we can. Um, and then we'll do the very best we can after that. We're recruiting in a manner that that is going to continue to build the roster moving forward. but. To say that you're going to continue, uh, you have to have a plan. Um, but I don't know what December is going to bring. I don't know what the transfer portal is going to bring. Uh, all I can do is build our team for this season, share the core values of who we are and what we're doing moving forward, and get as many people to buy into that vision as possible. But I'm not going to treat our guys any different. Um, I'm going to coach them. I'm going to love them the way I've, I've always loved them. I'm going to set the standard of who we are and what we're going to be about. Our coaches are going to set that standard. Um, and you can either choose to be a part of that moving forward or you cannot. And there's no judgment if not. That's that's awesome. And that's your, that's your choice. Is that sustainable for the majority of college football moving forward? I don't have a crystal ball on that. And that's the biggest issue. I, I don't. And I can't. <clears throat> I can only control what I can really control. Um, the only other thing I can give out is opinions, uh, but that opinion doesn't 
I can complain about what's wrong, but I'm not really providing any tangible solution. So instead of worrying about that, I'm focused on what I can control and what I can do. I feel like if you can share a collective person, we're all passionate about this game of football, right? We're all passionate about playing the game. All those guys in my locker room are competitive. All my coaches are competitive and they have passion for this game. I've got to unite them in a purpose. And I feel like if I can give a compelling vision for the future, uh, I can get people to join in that vision and that purpose moving forward. And that's what's going to keep them here. I, that's the only guardrails I have. That's the only guardrails I have. And so I'm trying to share, share a compelling vision for what our program is going to be under my leadership moving forward. Our goal is to win the SEC East in a bowl game with class and integrity and academic excellence. While you're here, we want you to chase two dreams, a life with football and a life outside of the game. We're going to want you to maximize your ability, your God-given talents through the game of football. We think, feel like that you can do that because we've got great strength and conditioning, great position coaches, great nutrition. We feel like you can maximize your life outside of football because the internship opportunities, great academic opportunities, an AAU institution, which is only 63 in the country, um, and so you, you're going to have an opportunity to chase both of those dreams. We're going to pursue those dreams through four core values every single day. Always compete, build trust and respect, do more than what's expected, and enjoy the journey. That's who we are. That's what we're going to do. It. That's how we're going to do it. And if people want to assimilate to that, great. And if they don't, then they have the freedom to choose other things. I've never been there before, so this is the first time for me to be involved in a spring meeting. I've sat in other meetings before, and <clears throat> um, so this for me was a learning experience. I think there was several topics that I voiced my opinion on, um, and again, my opinion is based off what is in the best interest of the University of Missouri, and how does uh, the best interest of the University of Missouri serve? Um, I also understand that the best interest of the University of Missouri is to be an, a strong member of the SEC. And for the for the University of Missouri to thrive in the Midwest, we have to be a strong brand in the SEC. The SEC brand has to be strong. So I got to support whatever's in the best interest of the SEC. Um, so we did both of those. Honestly, that's kind of a hypothetical that I haven't even kind of got into mentally. Um, I'm still trying to make sure I got quarterbacks on the roster in NIL. So, um, I mean, it's a great question, but I, I just I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. You've said multiple times in the last few weeks that like what's happened in the last two years is probably the biggest change you've ever seen in college football. I, I'm curious with not just NIL and transfers, but everything that's changed around the sport and now. I know you've gone to like 35 different cities here in the last month. How much different is this job than you know what you thought this job was going to be when you took it three years ago? And how much more, more or maybe not sure uh, if you're more prepared than than you were you know three years ago, having gone through a little of it. Yeah, I would say this. I'm more prepared today to be the head coach in the University of Missouri than I was two years ago when I took this job. And that was because of the experiences that I've been through in the past two years. Um, the job's changed quite a bit. The dynamics of the job has changed quite a bit. But that's changed for everybody in the seats that they're in. Um, <clears throat> I think whenever you hire somebody to do a job, uh, you're hiring them based off the competency to adjust to whatever happens moving forward and I do think that that um, I have a clear vision for what I believe the University of Missouri can be and I'm pursuing that every single day as hard as I possibly can um, I don't know that anybody could argue that uh, that I'm not working as hard as I possibly can to, to do everything I can to help us win a championship whether that's visiting cities or recruiting or um, being intentional about uh, strategic um, placement of NIL opportunities or being in communities. I mean, we've got uh, a kids camp in St. Louis this weekend. We've got a kids camp, free kids camp in St. Louis this weekend. We got a free kids camp in Kansas City next weekend. We have a free two-day kids camp in Columbia that's got already got over 500 kids signed up. 
Um, we're trying to be great. We, we got a, 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 a camp today on our campus. It's got over 150 kids. We're going to be in Lindenwood tomorrow. Um, we're trying to be great ambassadors to this state, and I think that's where it starts. And that's something I'm, I've been passionate about since I was a high school coach. Um, the job is, like I said, the job has changed. Um, but that was, that's what makes it fun. You know, that's what, that's what as a competitor, you kind of like the challenges. Um, I think every, you know, I can't speak to what college football was back in the nineties or eighties and the, in the crazy changes that, that have occurred. But man, I can't imagine there's been any more influx of the way the college football has happened in the past two years. So. Marai. Thanks, y'all. Marai. Thanks, y'all. Marai. Thanks, y'all. Marai. Thanks, y'all.